We're well, looking at infant mortality, and um, from all we've discussed so far, we understand that there are different factors that could result in uh, an infant not making it to one month, one year, or even five years, as the case may be. And uh, key amongst them is malnutrition. Could you take us through the process, how it uh, affects the child? Um, food is very essential for the growth and the supply of nutrients for the functionality of the organ, tissue, and system of the body. So the baby have to grow and the food have to supply nourishment. I said, so when the baby, a newborn, whether a newness or an infant, or generally under five, if they're not getting the right food. It's not just food, but food that contain all the right nutrients in the right proportion, what we call the balanced diet. So you expect such a child, I mean, such a baby or such a, a newborn not to go very well. And when they're not growing very well, there's bound to be a sad death. And when there's a sad death, there's going to be a stunted growth. And the stunted growth, of course, will result to the collapse of, or a shutdown of the organ, which will result to the death of the baby. So that is why we advocate that for the uh, death of mortality. So in fact, nutrition is very important for the growth of the baby, as well as preventing infection disease, which is capable of causing an early death of a newborn. All right. The advocacy for exclusive breastfeeding has been trailed with mixed reactions. There are people who argue that uh, the economic reality do not support that. There are some who say, uh, looking at uh, the environmental factor, what kind of intervention will encourage the issue of exclusive breastfeeding in a place like Nigeria? Yes, uh, you see, the truth of the matter is that not every uh, women are working in the public sector. Governments have played their own part to ensure that women who work in the public uh, sector, they are given what we call three months uh, maternity leave. Even in some, uh, you know, organized private sectors, they also do it for, you know, uh, women. You know, this is to enable them, uh, you know, uh, um, other than the fact that it creates a bond between the newborn and the mother. It also gives enough time for the mother to breastfeed the baby. Because the, baby, the mother has to sit where, I mean, sit at home, eat, drink, I mean, take good food so that she can be able to breastfeed the baby. But in other sector, maybe those who are into, you know, a, a, a private job or those who are on their own, as the case may be. So that time might not be there. You see mother giving birth, after two weeks or three weeks, she's, you know, already leaving the baby, you know, with a nanny or a caregiver then to make a living for herself as a way of meeting up to the, you know, to our personal needs. So this might short change and make, uh, you know, the mother not be able to do the needful by, you know, uh, breastfeeding the baby, thereby causing malnutrition to this baby. Because, um, like as I said earlier on, this um, maternity leave that the public sector or the organized private sector give to their workers, that is the female per se, is to actually allow the women to breastfeed their baby so as to protect the baby from infection and to prevent a stunted growth. That is why this is put in place. Talking about breastfeeding, um, breastfeeding some breastfeeding. women will say that um, when the baby grows to maybe three, four months, and uh, particularly when it's uh, of the male gender, that the breast milk at some point doesn't become sufficient for the baby. So they need to complement with uh, formulas and other kinds of food. Is this true? Well, uh, that actually boils down to the feeding of the mother. For mothers who are well fed, you expect the, the breast to lactate, you know, even beyond six months. Because it's not just uh, uh, six months that the mother just stopped breastfeeding. 
Sometimes we advise that the mother can even breastfeed up to uh, two years, as the case may be. So mothers who are not well fed, that these are the women that we, though naturally some women, especially those uh, new the parents, those who are giving birth for the first time, but those who are giving birth for twice or twice as the case may be, the more your parity, I mean, the more you give birth, the more likely you are going to have a free flow of breast milk, you know, from your mystia. So taking good foods we actually, you know, uh, allow proper flow of, uh, you know, milk from the breast. So it's only when mothers are not well fed or maybe they are stressed up because of a, a, a job or other uh, daily activities, that is when you expect their, you know, uh, milk and their breast not to lactate very well. But when they stay at home, when they eat very well, of course, there is no doubt that exclusive breastfeeding, that is breastfeeding for six months, is very important. And the messy out the breast have to lactate very well when the mother is, you know, well, well fed and stayed, you know, for rest, as the case may be. Now for parents or mothers or fathers who are watching, I would like you to educate us on some of the basic nutrients needed by babies in at this stage and the impact on their survival or their health or the tendency for them to survive uh, at that infancy. What would be the impact of these nutrients? Maybe you talk about the composition, the impact, and also the, the, the chances that it will help them survive at that stage of infancy. Yes, the reason why we actually advocate the breast milk for babies so is to allow a proper growth and also to give immunity to the baby as a way of preventing disease and infection. So the breast milk actually contains the breast milk actually contains this required nutrient hydrogen protein. So the protein is one constituent of the breast milk. So babies need protein to grow to, for the replacement of one heart tissue. Not only that, water is also a component of the breast milk. So water is very important for the growth, for enzymatic uh, action of uh, the body is very important. Not only that, there is also a carbohydrate, but in a very minute uh, form, which is also a constituent of the breast milk. The vitamins too, those vitamins are also constituent of the breast milk. So in summary, for babies to grow, they need lactogen, which is a form of uh, milk proteins. That is the main ingredient that is required for the growth of a newborn. And this lactogen cannot be gotten this way, but from animal. And man is the major supplier of this uh, you know, protein. Though cow can also supply it. That is why even most of those uh, uh, artificial infant meat I also got it from the cow, you know, from the cow milk as the case may be. So that is the lactogen, that is which is the uh, uh, the protein, the milk protein as the case may be. Okay, for looking at uh, stunted growth, what is the um, what should be the average weight weight of a baby? So how do you know that oh this child is underweight, is having stunted growth, and the interventions to do to ensure that that child is able to go through that stage? And grow normally. Let's assume that a child is, yes. is already been stunted. What are the features you would see to know that oh, this child is not growing well? Firstly, we have to do this assessment at birth. That is at the zero uh, day. When once a child is giving birth to that, that, that when the baby is giving birth to, because uh, medically when we talk about child, child is from the age of uh, uh, twelve months. For 12 months, we talk about child. Then from zero to um, 28 days, for the first one month, we use the word neonates. So for a baby that is just giving birth to, we take the weight of that baby. So the baby should be 2.5 kg, 
to 3.9 kg. That is the normal weight of the baby. 2.5 kg to 3.9 kg. That is the average weight of the newborn. And after six months, we expect the weight of that newborn to double. What I'm trying to say is that if a baby is 2.5 kg at birth, at six months, it's supposed to be 5 kg. That is, it has doubled. But in the case of a stunted growth, or maybe the baby is not having what to call a quashoko or marasmus. So you expect the, some physical changes from that baby. You can see that the baby might not be growing well as evidenced by maybe the head not getting very big, you know, maybe the head getting sunken or the leg getting very thin, the face getting very thin, the abdomen getting protruded. And this is very common in African uh, uh, community, usually in the rural area. Like uh, uh, those women who face insurgency or because of, uh, you know, food starvation and the like. So these are some of the things that you see in those areas. And the uh, government, of course, have to do more advocacy to ensuring that women have to learn how to breastfeed their baby. And for them to do so, foods have to be made available for the women. It's only women that are fed well that can also feed their baby as a way of meeting up these, uh, you know, growth and as a way of preventing disease and infection from, you know, affecting those babies to ensuring proper growth. All right, we're still looking at the issue of infant mortality. I would like you to talk about some of the basic vaccines or medical interventions or if there are supplements or medical supplements that should be administered to babies at this stage to prevent infant mortality. Yes, um, to combating the infant mortality or death of a newborn, it's actually a multi uh, you know, approach with which the government have to play their role, that the parents too have to play their role. And one of the roles that the government have been playing over the years is to ensure that babies are well vaccinated as a way of preventing uh, you know, disease of the childhood, which includes uh, tuberculosis, measles, diphtheria, uh, diarrhea, even the uh, 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 xerophthemia, what we call vitamin A deficiency. So at birth, babies should take BCG to prevent them from tuberculosis. Not only that, babies will also take what we call the DPT, which prevent at six weeks, which prevent them from diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus. All these are killer disease that affect children. So at that early stage of life, governments are put in place to ensure that babies get those immunization as a way of getting a form of you know artificial immunity against those disease, which you know, are capable of causing death to the newborn because of their, you know, uh, 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 low immunity. Uh, not only that, children also get vitamin A supplement, as I said earlier on. Vitamin A is very important and is given orally at nine months and 12 months of age. Because babies who don't get this vitamin A as a form of a booster is also capable of causing mortality in this underage group. All right, uh, quickly, uh, let's look at some of the diseases and the time of the year they occur. Uh, I know that uh, diarrhea is one uh, disease that um, children battle with. So what should mothers know about some of these diseases and the time they come in and preventive measures? Yes, uh, diarrhea has been reported as one of the 
killer disease affecting under five age. Uh, if we talk about uh, infant mortality and we don't talk about diarrhea, it means we have not exhausted the causes of under uh, age or the under five, the cause of under five uh, deaths. So diarrhea, of course, is one of the killer disease in children. This diarrhea, of course, is an infectious disease and is very common in children between the age of two to five years. For the reason with that, in this age group, they are not prone to, you know, walking around, maybe crawling. So whatever they touch, it will always end up in their mouth. Even sometimes, because of the poor, uh, you know, environmental sanitation or poor hygiene, as the case may be, dirty environment, uh, you know, uh, poor water supply, contaminated water, infection, bacterial infection, uh, viral cholera, and the like, you know, they can get in contact with it, thereby, you know, causing this uh, diarrhea, which we, you know, manifest as uh, vomiting, passage of frequent uh, stool, and sometimes a uh, feverish condition. In fact, at any point in time, the mother noticed that the baby, whether uh, at two months or at three months or at six months, as the case may be, is now passing stool more than three times in a day, and the stool is becoming watery, and the baby too is also vomiting. That is already a diarrhea until proven otherwise. And diarrhea, of course, is an infectious disease, and it's one of the causes of, uh, you know, uh, infant mortality, which is very common in our environment. So there are strategies put in place. There are things the mother can do to reduce the, the complications of this diarrhea, because one of the complications of this diarrhea is dehydration. Because once a baby starts vomiting, starts stooling, so you expect that baby to start losing water. So this uh, loss of uh, fluid is what actually result to death. So, Mothers are advised to prepare what you call the salt sugar solution. This can actually be done at home. You know, uh, telling mothers about uh, uh, infant mortality, of course, telling them how to prevent or do some treatment at home, like this uh, treatment of diarrhea, is another way of combating the uh, uh, infant mortality. As I said earlier on, what mothers can do at home when they notice their babies not having frequent stooling or vomiting excessively, because this may result to dehydration, which is capable of causing death, is that they have to produce what we call the social gas solution. Though the, the social gas solution is a form of ROS, which can be gotten in most uh, a pharmacy shop or a chemist shop, as the case may be.